everybody. This is Tamaya Robles. I am a credit repair expert, credit repair specialist, what have you. I am the owner of Fix My Credit Now E50.com. And I am also the host, the creator of this podcast, Coast to Coast Credit. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So yeah, that's my usual introduction. I'm gonna get better with that, people. Just just work with me. All right. But um, today we are going into one of my segments that I told you all about. Um, I have two new segments that I'm going to have for strictly, exclusively this podcast um, on the airwaves, which is cool. One is what I would do if and that time when I, right? So right now it's one of those what I would do if, and if you can see the topic, it's what I would do if I was 18 and homeless again. Yeah, <laughs> keyword again. So I'm going to walk y'all through this journey of mine. This is true. These are facts. This is actually um, exactly what happened to me personally. Uh, again, this is a judgment-free zone, and I need this to be a safe place for everyone. Um, my business is a safe place. My clients know that. They know that they can be completely honest with me they pretty much have to be because I'm looking at their credit. I'm fixing their credit. Right. And I'm looking into their past financially and, you know, we get into certain situations a lot of times because of lack of education or just bad decision-making. Right. So I wanted to share my experiences with you guys to let you know that, yeah, I may be the credit person, but I wasn't always the credit person. <laughs> so I'm just going to share one of my stories today, which is that time when um, I was homeless, right? So there was a backstory to me being homeless. Uh, I won't get into detail in this conversation right now, but I'm just going to briefly explain to you at one point, I was in foster care. I was in the foster care system for a couple of years. I ran away from foster care. Uh, what year was that? I think it was 1997. Yeah, it was 1997 because in order to be admitted in uh, the shelter system, you had to be an adult. You had to be 18 years old. And I just turned 18, um, I think, like three days before um uh, going into the women's shelter. So, yeah. So I ran away from foster care and I went back to Philly. Um, I caught a bus. I had like one token or something left or like a dollar and some change, whatever it costs to get from where I was at to Philly. And then I went straight basically into the shelter system, right? That was very much an experience within itself. Uh, I was the youngest wherever I went. So because I was in a women's shelter, it was a lot of mothers, women that had their children or maybe had their children taken. And a lot of women that had their uh, kids taken, they kind of like grew attached to me. They looked at me as their, their daughter, which was like, okay, I guess at the time. I don't know if anyone out there has ever gone through homelessness or any sort of abandonment uh, or just street life within itself. But when you're in survival mode and you don't have the support of friends and family and you're on your own, you make the people around you family, right? So through that, through, through that whole process, um, I, got really cool with a lot of people, right? So that's not the the whole core of the story, but I'm just kind of trying to paint you a picture. So I my birthday is in January, which is the dead of winter in Philly. It was mad cold. I just got finished sleeping outside in the blizzard, like literally outside in the cold at the age of 18. And I was just trying to get from where I was at to Philadelphia. And I did so signed up with the shelter system through some people that I knew. And um, it was just mad bananas, bad, crazy. It was such a blur. Um, and thank God for being young and dumb because ignorance truly, truly is 
bliss. I did not realize some of the most extreme circumstances that I was around because of my ignorance. So cool. But ultimately, I was in a women's shelter in downtown Philadelphia, Center City, Philadelphia. And it was called the Salvation Army, broad in, I forgot the name of the street, but if y'all from Philly, y'all know, I think it's still standing. Now, with this, with this particular shelter, their job was to house you, but then they had programs there to help you move forward, to get you out of this homeless situation. So they did things such as, you know, signed you up for welfare if you didn't have a job. They didn't really have like job programs per se. They more so like would redirect you. And, and mind you, this is back in the day. This is like, like I said, this is 1997. So things were a little different then than they are now. Um, so they, that's what they did. Like they signed me up for welfare. So I didn't know what welfare was, by the way, um, prior to being, um, in foster care, I had a pretty sheltered, um, upper class lifestyle. Uh, so I, I didn't know. I, I felt through all of this stuff, like from the foster care system to the shelter. I have no idea how I got from point A to point B at sometimes, but they put me on food stamps. I didn't know what they were. Uh, I learned quickly, right? They, I would eat shelter food and I'm going to be honest with you, shelter food was really disgusting, <laughs> but you adapted, right? Um, what else did they do? And, oh, and they like prepared you as best as their resources allowed uh, on how to purchase a home. Not, not, I'm sorry, not purchase a home, how to get an apartment, okay? And, and it wasn't like a regular apartment. It would be like Section 8 or Section 8 base, something of that nature. Now, if you don't know what Section 8 is, Section 8 is a government funding, uh, a, a government supported, uh, I guess, um, how is the right word to say? It's a, a Section 8 is like, um, it's, it's like under the welfare system, but it's for houses and you get this voucher. And again, I'm taking y'all back to 97. I don't know what anything is like right now. So, you know, I apologize. I'm, I'm outdated. But it's if you don't have the money, you're low income, or maybe you had an emergency situation where let's say your house burned down, you lost everything, things like that. You would go to the government and you would request a, what's called a Section 8 voucher. And certain homes are Section 8 approved. Like it could be an apartment, apartment complex. It could be a, a duplex, triplex. It could be a single family home. Hell, it could be a mansion. You know, I'm sure there might be a Section 8 mansion somewhere. I doubt it. But it could be... Um, the slums, it could be the projects, it could be townhouses, or it could just be like a regular home that the landlord or the owner decided to um, sign up with Section 8 and get funded. So if you are a landlord, then you would go to this program and sign up. And once you're approved, like they come out, make sure your house is suitable to live in and safe, things like that. Then they will, once you get a tenant, they will automatically give you your portion of the rent the first of the month on time, no questions asked, like automatic, right? And that's what people love. And as far as the tenant is concerned, the tenant is responsible for whatever uh, portion of the rent that Section 8 deems fit. So what they do is they calculate any sort of income that you may have um, and do whatever calculations are necessary. They take the cost of the rents and then they figure out how much you should be paying and then they pay the rest in a nutshell. So that's a little snippet. If you want to know more, just Google it. But yeah, so the shelter system, again, it kind of just gave you resources so you could get out of the shelter situation because the shelter was a temporary situation. We didn't really have many counselors there aside from people overseeing us, making sure that we were fed. Uh, we came in during curfew. Um, things were safe. Uh, sometimes they literally got people off the street. Back then the homeless epidemic was pretty bad 
And especially during the winter, they would have these cold colors uh, in the winter. If it was too cold for the homeless to be out, it would be considered a cold blue. And the police would go out in the streets of Philly and gather homeless people, right? And just bring them in, in any shelter and they would just dump everybody in this room. And we used to call that room the spillover room. And a little FYI, yes, I was in the shelter, but we had uh, different floors. So if you were there and you planned on being at the shelter for a couple of days, week, well, uh, I guess, yeah, days or weeks, then you had like a bed, right? And it was like, one, it would be four beds to a room. And, but if you were just brought in off the street, then you were dumped into this spillover room, which is basically just think of a huge living room, maybe a table or chair here and there with homeless people just from off the street as is junkies, whatever, um, criminal, you don't know, just people here up in the streets, but it was a women's shelter. So, I mean, that was a plus. Um, but yeah. And if you were there and you were a resident long-term, like I was, and let's say you missed a curfew, they would make you sleep in the spillover room. I had to do that one time. You know what I'm saying? And never again, never again. But anywho, so while I was in the shelter, um, I was everybody's daughter and a lot of people looked out for me. I just turned 18. Um, I was obviously ignorant. I was obviously living a sheltered life. I know people tease me about my accent or whatever. I really don't think I have one, uh, like a Philly accent or whatever. But at the time, I used to sound like a valley girl. <laughs> like I used to sound, if you don't know what a valley girl is, just look it up, right? I used to sound just like that. So I looked like I, and sounded like I needed some help. <laughs> I didn't think so. I was cool. Cause like I said, prior to being in the shelter, I was in foster care for a couple of years. So I adapted and I tried to get rid of that Valley girl sound as quickly as possible, but I digress. So as time went on, um, I was trying my best to utilize what little bit of services that they had, but I wasn't understanding. I wasn't understanding the Section 8 voucher thing. Um, I wasn't really doing much, but just being passed through the system, um, which is very easy to do. It's very easy to get passed through the system, get lost in the system, what have you. But all I had at that time was the shelter system and welfare, right? So after four months, I was told that I had to be transferred out of the shelter system because I didn't get a house. I probably didn't have a job. I don't recall at the time. Um, uh, I didn't have any real source of income, things like that. So uh, they naturally had to put me in what's called a transitional shelter. So a transitional shelter, it looks like an apartment setting and like you might have your own room. Um, you, and you have these roommates and you're all homeless, right? You're all deemed homeless and you are supposed to transition from one type of housing to another, and you're supposed to move forward. So as you're living here, you're supposed to go to school, go back to college if need to get some sort of training get a job. And here's where you have counselors. And this is where you have um, people that uh, will help you through this journey of life. If this is what you want, if you need um, drug treatment, they have someone for there. If you need AA meetings, they got that. It's, it's supposed to be completely beneficial to you and help elevate you, right? Now, as you can hear, I am pretty much a smart cookie. I'm very intelligent. So regardless of where I was at in life, anybody that knows me, especially if you know me from back in the day, one thing you will say about me is that the Maya is smart as shit, because I am, right? So I might have been oblivious to the hood or like the bottom of the bottom, which I was living in at the time, but I was smart enough and crafty enough to do certain things, to use my brain. Um, I was, 
I did drop out of school, out of high school. Don't worry. I did get my high school diploma. I did not get my GED. When you come from a family of scholars <laughs> and you tell them, hey, I'm going to get my GED, that's a huge, huge no-no. So what I did was I turned to my counselors. I leaned towards my counselors and I tried to get some sort of guidance. And I did know that I couldn't stay in this transitional shelter forever and I needed to get a house, right? Or an apartment rather, because houses and buying houses at that time, I didn't even know that was a thing or how that worked. Um, you know, being a teenager, it's like, whatever. I don't know. You're just going with whatever flow you're on at that time. For the record, no, I was not out there tricking. No, I was not on crack or heroin or drugs or whatever, just to be abundantly clear. The reason why I say that is because when I tell people my story, especially when I was in the shelter, like people would be so amazed that I wasn't a prostitute and smoking crack. <laughs> and I used to be like, am I supposed to? Like, I'm already homeless. Like, I just got finished sleeping outside in the cold, in the blizzard, where it was literally record lows. It was like 10 below. And I, I couldn't feel my toes and my fingertips. I had a first down jacket that didn't zip up. I'm walking through the city that I was in foster care with, and I'm walking for miles and miles trying to find a warm place to live. And I couldn't find one. And somewhere in your mind, you're thinking, thank God she didn't smoke crack. Like my situation was already messed up. Crack is not going to help me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, is it going to warm up my fingertips? Is it going to fill my belly up with food? Is it going to find me a warm place to live? Nah. Now being a prostitute, do you think that is going to help me? Now, mind you, I'm not judging anyone that needed to do what they needed to do to get where they're at today. But I'm talking about me personally. Nah, that wasn't my twist. So a lot of people seem to ask me that question when I tell this type of story. So I just want to let you know, no, I was not tricking. No, I was not smoking crack. I, I was smoking weed, but, you know, it's weed. You know, who wasn't? Other than that. No, I wasn't junkie. I was just young and extremely ignorant, very impressionable, all that, but just not that. All right, back to the story. So I leaned a lot on the counselor, right? And I also became very, very cool with a girl named Tasha. And Tasha was a couple of years older than me. Um, and we became very close friends. We were, we came from the same shelter at the same time we were transferred and she wound up going to the transitional shelter with me. And she was also very intelligent. Um, she, again, just hard times. I think she was escaping abuse. So some women do go to the shelter because, um, not necessarily they're homeless, but you know, they're getting out of an abusive situation and that's what she was doing. Um, and she literally lived over top of my head. So her apartment in her room was exactly over mine. So it was super cool to have somebody to go through this journey with. And every time you saw her, you saw me. And when you saw me, you saw her. And we would lean on our counselor. There's this older white lady. She was super cool. And for her to be as old as she was, she was very much with the times, right? And she used to see us sitting on the step, hanging out, <laughs> right, in the summertime with our booty shorts, see what I mean, and just kicking it because it was fun back then. Just totally not comprehending, like, this is an extreme situation and you need to get a house ASAP, right? So one time she saw us sitting on the step and she was called us over and was like, girls, you know, how old are you? And then I was like, well, you know, I just turned 18 a couple months ago, like six months ago, right? So she was like, mm, okay, okay, okay. And then she said to Tasha, like, how old are you? And, I, and Tasha was like, I don't know, like 20 or something like that. And she's like, you guys are very intelligent, um, but why aren't you in college? And we did this thing where, you know, what do you mean? We're homeless. <laughs> you know, what do you mean college? What are you talking about? And she put us down with some game. 
right? She said, first of all, why are you homeless when you're of age? You can go to college and you can live in the dorm and you can get grants and you can get scholarships and you can do this. You're homeless. You're, you could, you got resources here. And I didn't think about that. And, and we were like, oh, she's mad intelligent, but we ain't doing that shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, we ain't doing none of that shit. We're out here in these streets, living our best life, getting some free government food, some government assistance, you understand, uh, some free housing. And then we were on this Section 8 waiting list. And back then, people were on the Section 8 waiting list for 20 plus years, right? Like, they, they were going to wait a whole adult to make sure they got a Section 8 voucher. When you have Section 8, there's two different versions, if I'm not mistaken, maybe three. I think there's an emergency voucher. There is um, a, a Section 8 voucher, and then there's being placed. There's no voucher, but it's Section 8 base. And Section 8 base is where they give you a list of places where you can um, – move into like apartment complexes, but you have to stay there. Like you can't move when you want to move. You have to stay there and you're literally on the waiting list to get your voucher. Once you get a section eight voucher, it's worth more and you can move anywhere literally in the world. And yes, they have section eight worldwide. It's mad crazy unless things changed. And what some people were doing, they were just making babies and, you know, abusing the system. I was about to be one of the people abusing the system. So was my home girl. Right. And we, the goal was just to wait it out as long as you possibly could to get that voucher. That's how ignorant we were at that time. You know what I mean? Let's get these, this welfare. Let's do this. Let's, you know, this is life. We don't have to pay for shit. We don't have to be responsible for anything. Right. Cool. Moving right along, we told her, forget that college thing. That sounds good, but that's not the bag we're on, all right? So fast forwarding, um, I moved out of the transitional shelter. Tasha and I kind of did at the same time. She got her apartment. Hers was Section 8 base. I got my apartment. It was Section 8 base. I didn't pay any utilities. I didn't pay electric. I didn't pay heat. I didn't even... If there was a rent, I don't recall. I want to say there wasn't rent at that time because I don't think I had a job at the time. But it was a cute little apartment for one person with no kids. Um, my food, boom, welfare, you know what I mean? And then all of a sudden, my phone didn't work and I didn't have electricity. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, what's up with that? Like, what the fuck happened to the, you know, the utilities? And lo and behold, you're supposed to have a job to pay for this electricity. So what did Tamaya do with her amazing brain? She wasn't going to go out and get a job. No, no, no. What she was going to do was she was going to go back to the government, say what needs to be said so she can get what she wants. And guess what? They had a program. If you were low income and you were on Section 8 or you were on welfare, right? And you couldn't afford and your electricity was shut off. You couldn't afford it. They will pay for it and then some, right? So that's what they did. Now, I did some old other shady stuff, but, you know, we'll talk about that in another story. But I actually, side note, I did some fly shit and then I got credited and they sent me a check. It was crazy. It was crazy. It was crazy. But, anyhow. but yeah, so they paid for my electricity. It got turned on. Side note, another side note. If you're from Philly, I can't speak for all of the East Coast, but I want to say, like, especially uh, the East Coast that gets really bad winters, like Philly, right? There was also a thing where once it was deemed officially winter, you did not get your electric shut off if your electric heated your home, right? And I knew that I had an electric, um, uh, electric heating so there were years I just wasn't paying because either I was having the government pay it or I knew that it was officially winter and I'm not going to be paying <laughs> the electric bill, right? So once it was officially spring, this is back in the day where we would go to the actual electric company to pay our bills and make payment arrangements and stuff like that. There would be a long line. It would be so long. Like they would talk about this on the news 
the first day of spring, it will be a long line um, on the block. I think it was, what is it? 52nd and Walnut. That, that's where they were. All right. In West Philly. And it would be a long line at the electric company because everybody's trying to negotiate that payment. And I was one of them people, yo. I was one of those people. Sure enough, didn't get the electricity turned off ever again, but I wasn't paying, right? I wasn't paying, moving right along. I did a video where I talked about um, schooling because the lady told me, she said, well, if you don't want to go to college, like you should, you should go to school or get a job because even if you don't get a job and you're in school, you can still continue to get funded by the government. So my lazy ass is like, all right, you know, cool. I'll just go to school. And I was like, I want to be a barber. Boom. I woke up, wanted to be a barber. I've never cut hair before. It was never a thing. That's a whole other story. So, I, But I did sign up and got a student loan for to go to barber school. It was called Gordon Phillips. If anybody's from Philly, we're in that area one time. You know what I'm saying? Gordon Phillips and its competitor was Empire, right? And one was like hood and one was supposed to be classy. And, and Gordon Phillips was like supposed to be some classy French barber school or hair salon. I don't know. It was weird. But anywho, I went there and I had to take a test. And that test was for people who did not have a high school diploma or a GED. And at that moment, I didn't have one. So they were like, before you come here, um, you have to take this test and it will determine if you need to go back to school before you come here to get your GED or your high school diploma, or if you're smart enough, you just go in. I took the test. They called me back and they were like, oh my gosh, why aren't you in college? And I'm like, because I don't want, I don't get it. I don't want to be. I'm out in these streets getting this free government assistance. You know what I'm saying? Living rent free money. Like, I'm good. Why? And they said, you scored so high on your test. Like, we never saw this before. You're practically at genius level. Um, you don't need to be here. You need to be at a university. And I was like, you know what? No, I want to, I want to go here. So I went to barber school and I got really bored, dropped out. Then I was like, okay, let me, let me try going to college. And mind you, this whole time, I'm not really talking to my parents like this. Like they don't know any of the crap I'm going through. You know what I mean? It's, we had a super bad relationship and had it for years. So it was like, I'm not going to start talking to them now. So um, I went to community college of Philadelphia. I actually went two different times and I went and again, I got a student loan, got bored. Oh no, I got a grant. I'm sorry. I did not get a loan. I got a grant. I got mad bored, dropped out. And I went again, I think when I was 30, the day I turned 30, I went back, went to school, stayed maybe for a year and then dropped out. Right. But I got grants and keep that in mind. I got grants. Keep in mind a lot of these points in this story, because I'm going to circle back and explain what I should have done, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And what you can do if you're in any of these situations or you're trying to get out of any of these situations or you know somebody that's going through any of these situations, okay? It may be out, the story itself might be outdated. However, the resources are never really outdated. There's always options, people, like I always say, moving right along. So, um, I dropped out of everything, blah, blah, blah. I did eventually start working. I worked a lot of bullshit jobs. I worked a lot of bullshit jobs. And then I decided to move every time I moved, except one time in my life, it was always a better situation than before, even with section eight. And then I'm the type of person, I'm a control freak. I don't like people telling me what to do. And, um, so Section eight, if you know anything about section eight is it, they will, they will give you a voucher when they feel like it. However, there's a lot of rules. Like people can't live with you. You got to report your income all the time, blah, blah. And I didn't feel like doing all that. Like I could be shady and I can, you know, do certain things to keep it going. But real talk, like I didn't feel like going through all that. And I still wanted to live rent free and I wanted free government assistance and all that. And then after a while, like I guess time went on and I just matured and I still didn't know what credit was. I still didn't know about savings, finances, all of that. I just knew that 
I didn't want anyone telling me what to do. I didn't, I, I didn't care for the government, still really don't to a certain degree. Um, I just don't like people telling me you can't do X, Y, and Z. Because if you tell me I can't do something, I'm going to show you that I can do something. If you're saying such and such is impossible, I'm going to show you that it's now possible. And I'm going to do what I got to do to get what I want and show you and rub it in your face. And then I'm done with it. And then I move on. That's just my character. And I've, I've, put that character into my business, right? Like my mom used to always tell me, uh, Hey, you just, you just need to use your powers for good. If you use your powers for good, you'd be absolutely amazing. And I'm like, Shh, you know what? And that's what I do now. I use my powers for good. Right. So fast, fast, fast forward. I eventually got off of welfare. I eventually got off of section eight. It was actually um, unfortunate because I was using the system. I knew I was using the system and I knew it was wrong. And I had a job. I had a decent paying job at the time, no kids, whatever I could stand on my own. And um, with section eight, because it's such a long waiting list, um, you can actually, if you get off of section eight, you can actually write sign over your section eight voucher to someone who needs it. And uh, because I've grown so much, uh, my circle was not, did not consist of anyone who needed a section eight voucher. You know, I was the only one in my circle uh, who was even on section eight and people didn't even know I was on section eight unless I told them. So I tried to find somebody to sign it over to, but I couldn't. And I had only a limited amount of time to relinquish my voucher. Uh, so I unfortunately didn't go to anybody. So then I stood alone and then I got my first real apartment and it was really nice <laughs> in Winfield, in West Philly. Uh, this is the area where, where Will Smith is from. If anybody doesn't know Winfield, it's like a nicer part of West Philly like a bougie-esque part of West Philly. Some people part think from Winfield think that they're in the suburbs. You're not. Like, it's still West Philly. If you cross the street, if you cross City Avenue, that's the suburbs. But nah, like, you could, you're still in West Philly. So, but it was really nice. I had a nicer paying job. And then just super-duper fast forward, time went on. I just got better jobs, lived in better situations. I had a kid later had another kid and life went on and so on and so forth. But that is the story of the homelessness part, 18 and homeless. And this is what I went through. You dig me? Through all of that, I destroyed my credit. I didn't know what credit was. Through that, I had um, a student loan from Gordon Phillips on my credit report. I didn't know what that was. Um, I didn't know what that was. I couldn't tell you what happened with that. Right. And that's part, it all ties into this particular episode, this story. All right. That was the story. That's what happened. That was real life. This is what happened to me. If I could be 18 again, if I could be that 18 year old Tamaya who was homeless. So once again, and who just got off the bus from sleeping outside, after I thawed my toes and my fingertips and got a decent night's sleep in the shelter, okay, the first thing I would do is contact the counselors that are there. Even though their resources are very limited, they are resourceful enough because they work for the city that they can refer you out to someone who knows better things than they, mo knows more than them, okay? That would have been my mission and my goal if I were to do that again. I would get some sort of a job. Now, I will be honest with you, when you're in a shelter system, even though they promote, uh, they encourage you to get a job and get education because you're under the government's thumb, they have so many rules and regulations, even with that. So some people that worked, let's say night shift, because it was more money, uh, you have to think you are in a shelter and you have a curfew. You needed to get approval for these things. And that was a process. And we all know the government doesn't work quickly, not even with the shelter system. So sometimes people were losing 
uh, job opportunities because the approval process was taking too long. So therefore it slowed us all down, you know? So this is always some sort of obstacles. And that's another reason why I can't stand government anything. It's just too many. You're holding me back, man. Like it's just making me sick. I can't take it. And I like to feel free. I like to feel like I don't have options. I don't like I have options and, and, I'm not suppressed. You dig me? So, yeah. So I would definitely do that. I would work very closely with the, what the counselors that we did have. Right. And because I was a fan favorite, because I was such, I was, I just turned 18 and I was everybody's daughter. Um, I would have also, uh, got some knowledge and listened to people's stories and ask, ask questions um, because these women have lived their lives and they're still living it. And they were watching over me as far as safety was concerned. They knew I was out here just acting a fool, but they had other knowledge that they could have given me and I should have asked the right questions. How did you get here? Why did you get here? Not everybody was there for abuse. Some people financially just couldn't take care of their responsibilities. They got laid off and became homeless and their kids were taken. I don't know, you know, not everybody's a junkie, you know, um, times are just hard. And I should have utilized my environment to benefit me, ask questions, you know, done a little research. Now, when I got to, and, and got in a job. So when I did get trans for, from the the women's shelter to the transitional shelter, it would have been an easier transformation and I would have been uh, comfortable at least having knowledge and some sort of money if I had a job. Now, if I didn't have a job still, like this actual story, and I'm in the transitional shelter. The transitional shelter lets you, you could live there for up to a year. And if you needed an extension, then I think they gave you like four or five months. And after that, you were going to literally be back in the shelter, you know, the women's shelter, if there was space available. Um, some shelters were nicer than others. Luckily, the Salvation Army Women's Shelter downtown that I was in was actually pretty decent, but I heard some some horror stories, yo. I mean, yeah, <laughs> there was some situations where shelters were just deplorable. You understand? I'm sure you can imagine. But anyway, if I was in that shelter and I knew I was, had a year plus, I would have um, either gone to school, like the woman said, even if I wasn't living in a dorm, uh, going back to school and because there were a lot of scholarships I could have obtained grants because I was homeless, because I was in foster care, because I was in a shelter before. I mean, there were so many ways of me elevating my education, getting the highest education possible and not paying a dime and not owing anyone. and living rent free at least for a year minimum right also what the woman stated the counselor in the transitional shelter the older lady that I was telling you about she had a brilliant idea which was for us to live in a dorm I should have listened I should have lived that dorm life and I didn't because I was just too ignorant so I would definitely do that again, because that is what, four years, four years, as opposed to a year, right? It was four years of living somewhere that's going to be fully funded by the government anyway, right? Because I qualify for scholarships, grants, so on and so forth, right? Also, my parents, like I said, I come from a line of scholars, especially on my father's side. So it's either principals or, you know, um, attorneys, what have you. I don't know what all degrees all of my family has. I just know for the most part, my parents have and some of my aunts and uncles. And I think I have two aunts that were principals, right? And then I think some of my cousins are teachers. So I say this to say, I could have went to their school. Even my grandfather went to University of Pittsburgh and he was a teacher there. I could have gone to their school 
And um, my mother graduated from Temple. My mom, no, she, let me think, Rutgers University is where she got her college degree. And then she went to Temple University for her law degree. And then my father went to LaSalle University, right, for his degree. And then he went to Temple Law as well to get his law degree. I could have gone to those colleges. You understand what I'm saying? I could have. I could have gone to those colleges and probably got some sort of reduction or discount in my loan. I could have even worked for the school. Remember, I'm out here in these streets not working, living off government stuff. Because how it was set up then, again, I, I'm getting older, y'all. I don't know what it's like now in college. But then I could have gone to school for free and worked at the school. And as long as you have at, at that time, as long as you were working there, you could have gone to school for free. And then your parents went there and your grandparents and your aunt. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I would have done differently. All right. Another thing that I would have done now, remember I'm all for utilizing and getting government assistance as needed. The problem comes in when you're being abusive, when you're abusing the system, right? And again, this is no judgment. Those that know me, y'all know, y'all, you, you know, you know me, know me. All right. Look at me. All right. Roll them. Now, those that don't know me, I am going to always say this. There is no judgment here. We all have a story. I'm telling you my story. You understand? I'm telling you straight up what I did. And I can't honestly tell you that if the circumstances didn't uh, presented itself, if I if I had to do what needed to be done to get I'm I'm gonna do it. I, I can't confirm or deny. You understand? So when you guys come to me and you need me to fix your credit, you don't need to tell me your backstory. You don't. I don't want you to feel guilty. I don't want you to feel ashamed at all. We all got our stories here. And this is, nobody's in a position to judge. All right. I did a lot of stuff and we, I'm sure we all did. Okay. But I do want to make it clear. Once you're at a point where you can stand on your own, it's time to pass the torch <laughs> to someone who, who needs it. You know, don't be like me where I'm just abusing the system just because I could. All right. So when it came to that situation, I may have needed, you know, maybe welfare or the transitional shelter for a year, maybe a little longer than a year. Right. Or the the grant money to pay my electric bill, my phone bill, because, yes, I did get my phone bill because this is back when remember back in the day where there was a landline and then they had, uh, it, it was like this amazing thing. They used to give phone books and white pages out every year. And then they had this, uh, caller ID box that would, <laughs> like, if you've got a caller ID box, yo, you were doing things. And if there was call and then you had the call waiting caller ID that you connected to the base of your phone. And then if you were really doing things in life, if the join, lit up, right? It went doot doot. And then the joint lit up. That means you got a call on hold, right? Yo, I'm talking back then because what they would do is if you got that, they added an extra charge to your phone. I wasn't paying none of that. You dig me? But I found a way, some government assistance that paid for all of that. You dig me? That paid for all of that. Free electric, free heat, free food, you know what I mean? <laughs> free phone, shit. And, and I could get you some free clothes if you need that too. But once you're done or you've learned or educated yourself on how to move to the next level and stand on your own, then you're supposed to stop. So that's something else I would have done again differently, right? Because at this point, I'm like 19 going on 20. So you know, there was enough help, more than enough help, but I just didn't want it, right? Now, 
at some point in my life, there was a situation where I did need my credit checked and I don't recall what it was and I didn't know what credit was, but the lady was like, yeah, you have this student loan on your credit report. I'm like, I didn't go to college. What are you talking about? I forgot about the, the Gordon Phillips join when I was in barber school. And I thought I was going for free because I don't know. I just thought I was going for free. I don't know. Cause in my head, everything was free. So I'm like, yeah, I'm going to school for free. And they tested me and I'm practically a genius. Right. So boom, I should be going to school for free. Nah, son. What they did was they were scam artists and they would prey on, I really hate using these words, but I mean, that's what they use urban society, I guess. And Gordon Phillips would, would advertise to the hood that, yeah, you could go, you could, if you want to be a beautician, you can go here. If you want to be a barber, go here, go to Gordon Phillips barber school. It's amazing. Whatever. And you see the French people getting a haircut and whatever, even though the, it wasn't like that in the hood. That's why real hood people went to empire. Because <laughs> like, like, you know, anybody from Philly, you remember this back in the day, yo. Please leave a message. Please leave a comment, yo, because it was just so fun back then. But anywho, but the real hood, like Pete, because you know how you might have brothers and you got to learn how to cut your own hair or your dad taught you how to cut hair or whatever. And you want to be a barber or whatever. You can't have, uh, you need a license. So you have to go through the schooling, you know? Well, real hood, niggas <laughs> it is what it is calling the spade a spade went to empire right those that wanted to be upper echelon from the hood they went to gordon phillips and i will tell you if you went to gordon phillips they destroyed your credit what they did was it was predatory lending, right? So they would advertise in the hood. They'd be like, we got you. Come to Gordon Phillips. I got this French person talking. People that didn't look like anybody from the hood, they didn't, this is horrible. But they were like, come on, we got you. Just sign up. And so many people signed up. And so many people were approved for a student loan. You know why? Because we were just signing papers right on the spot because that's what they did. I remember when I went to Gordon Phillips and I signed up. And once they approved me, um, after I passed that test, they, I, they told me to come in the next day and I had to go into this office again. I'm 18, 19 years old and I'm just signing papers. I, it was a lot of papers and I was like skimming through them. Cause I knew you should read stuff, but it was just so tiring. And I just really wanted to cut hair for that moment. And that's what I was signing away. I was signing my whole life away with this stupid um, student loan. And it prevented me from getting anything at all, right, for a while. But I, I wasn't super duper trying. But whatever I was trying to get at that time, they rejected me. Now, fast forward a little bit. I'm riding SEPTA. If anybody knows what SEP, doesn't know what SEPTA is, it's the public transportation of Philly. And that's how we get around. Most of us, if you're not driving and I'm sitting and it's like a year or so after the whole Gordon Phillips fiasco. And I saw a former student, a fellow student of mine. And sis was like, Hey, you remember Gordon Phillips? Yeah. And she was like, guess what? They were robbing us. They were stealing money and the schools were stealing our information and doing all this illegal stuff. So if you happen to have uh, a student loan on your credit report, it's going to be forgiven. Again, I am so back then, if you said anything ever pertaining to a credit report, even if you said the word credit or credit report, it was like, you're talking a different language. I didn't know what you were talking about, nor did I care. But when she said that, I was like, oh, okay, thank you. And I totally dismissed it. But she was right. Later on, years down the line, um, I did get a letter in the mail uh, stating that it was from the Department of Education. And they let us know that if you signed up for student uh, a student loan with Gordon Phillips, it was you were instantly forgiving. You owed them nothing, blah, blah, blah. Now, Again, the title of this is what I would do if 
I was 18 and homeless again. And what I have actually done a video on recently, I would apply it to my situation. The moment I found out that Gordon Phillips was shady and that chick told me about the credit, first of all, I needed to obviously educate myself about what the fuck credit is. Cause I tried to get something with credit and was rejected. And that was told seven years. Even if you don't know what the fuck you're talking about, somebody saying you can't do something for seven years to a person like me, that's a trigger. That's a trigger. Like seven years, I can't do something. Let me figure something out. So I should have figured out what credit was to the best of my ignorant capability at that time. Then the next thing would have been to do a little bit more research and figure out what was up with the school and then get that off of my credit report. So when it comes down to student loans, now I'm going to kind of quickly talk about some credit stuff for the moment. I am a credit person, right? Uh, I know you guys just love, love, love to talk about credit at your student loan and getting it removed off your credit report. And I don't really agree with that per se, but if you're desperately needing to get it off, I mean, completely discharged, you don't owe anything, blah, 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 bet, I got you. Go see if your school is on the list, okay? The list meaning you can literally go to the Department of Education. You don't even have to log on. If you do have an account and you forgot, it's just very simple to reset your password. And I do this for people. People pay me to get their student loans completely discharged. I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars. I'm, I've am forgiven millions at this point. I'm not making it up. I'm not tooting my own horn, but nobody else is going to toot it, so whatever. But um, yeah, it's, it's not difficult. But you should check and see if your school is on that list, all right? It, there's a list of schools that have lawsuits. They've been sued. They did predatory lending. They weren't real school. Like, it's you'll be amazed. And Biden has kind of touched up on this. Biden is trying to give this illusion that he is the student loan savior. Well, all he's doing is talking about stuff that's been out and that's been out in these streets and he's like renaming some stuff. Like I have no respect for what he's doing. He's making it seem like you get a discharge, you get forgiven. It's not like that. Like we just didn't know these things existed, but guess what? They exist. And there's multiple ways to skin a cat. Yeah. And one of the ways is to read and figure things out or hire me, fix my credit now, 850.com. And we could do it for you. Is it time consuming? I will be honest with you. Yes, <laughs> it does. But if you are one of your one of those DIYers, do it yourselfers. I mean, just look and see. And they actually have several different types of lists. Um, and then just read if you if you fall under uh, a potential discharge, things like that. Gordon Phillips was definitely one of them. Um, I had a student, um, a student, a client a couple years ago and she lived in Georgia and she's back out here in Cali cause she's from, she is from Cali and she found me and she was trying to get an apartment or whatever, but she had this student loan, same situation. And I, she told me the story uh, and she heard, she heard that the, the, um, the hair salon school, the beauty school that she was attended was shady, but she didn't, she didn't do much about it and she didn't, she pretty much gave up and she was like, oh, you probably can't do anything. I'm going to try, I'm going to pay you and see how it goes, yada, yada. And then boom, 30 days later, uh, I got her completely discharged because I found her school. Not only did I find her school, but man, I went on the internet. I saw news clippings. I found video where they're <laughs> talking about how trash the school is and how the um, owner of the school uh, broke is you know, the owner of the school uh, was stealing all of the students' personal information and opening up like credit cards. It was bananas. So I I, I would do that differently, <laughs> like, and y'all should consider that as well. You know, but in a nutshell, yes, we've all made some st mistakes. We've done things out of ignorance, um, and it's affected us. It's affected our credit. It's affect affected us. And sometimes even how we think now, you know, because of what we've done, some of the self-trauma 
that we've done, whether it's financially, emotionally, psychologically, whatever, you know, it, but there are ways to get out of it. There's always options. And the million dollar question is, if you could do it again, what would you have done differently? And since you can't do it again, what can you change moving forward? That's the million dollar question. And I'm going to leave it off with that. Please, please, please be sure to like, comment, subscribe. I appreciate you all. You guys know that. Thank you for listening. Um, if you're checking out the podcast in the in airways, <laughs> I guess as you call them, be sure to, you know, subscribe and like and download and do your thing. All right. In the meantime, it was great talking to y'all and I look forward to seeing you guys in the future. You have a good one. Bye-bye.